Welcome, Bram, and welcome, Arthur. I've got today with me Bram Legru, He's a, who is a Belgian-born psychologist and entrepreneur. And I've also got Arthur Callis here, who is a financial services professional and entrepreneur in the financial services space. My name is Kylie Denton. I'm a thought leader when it comes to sales and leadership in the financial services space. And today we thought we would start on a topic that I think all of us have experienced at some stage or not, was around toxic work relationships. What do I mean by toxic work relationships? I mean, those people that, you know, when you hear about bullying in the workplace, or it could be the sabotages, could be the gossipers, could be the people that are just negative. You know, hey, there's some people in your office, they're negative, or we've got complainers. It's those type of people that we're talking about today. And I think we've all experienced them. But Arthur, one of the things that we often talk about, and you only said it the other day, was that you've just experienced someone toxic in the workplace. Share with us what, what, what went on. Oh, look, uh, great, great to be talking to you, Kylie and Brahm, on, on such a, an interesting topic. Um, look, I think avoid at all costs um, and preventative measures. I think, you know, when you start any kind of relationship is you know, really ensuring that, you know, there's, a, there's a, a meeting of the minds in terms of expectations and it's documented. We've uh, we've all had um, hires that have not gone to plan. Um, and there's probably a couple of different models here, isn't there? There's the employee-employer relationship. There's the, you know, um, startup business to, you know, Business partner to business partner relationship, yeah. um, and in and in my case, obviously, you know, licensee to AR relationship. So I'll just start off with that. My recent experience is not with one of my ARs. So I'll just get that out there. <laughs> uh, but, uh, um, it was more with uh, a, a, another business of mine that uh, probably didn't go to plan. But you know, reflecting, I, I probably failed uh, in many cases. That I'd probably let a personal relationship override what I normally would do in that you know, arm's length engagement and actually have all those systems and agreements in place up front and clarity. And then, you know, it kind of dragged on for two, two plus years and you kind of go through this wave, you know, you go through this wave of, you know, hope and, you know, um, ambition uh, around a new venture, you know, and then you kind of get a little bit confused and you're kind of like going, you know, what, what's going on here? It's not really working out. And then you start to probe and you have a look and then you, you know, then you know, oh, is there any, any inequity occurring here between you know what I'm putting on the table and what this other individual's put on the table, and then you know all of a sudden it turns into a bit of resentment, you know, and you you find you questioning yourself, and and then 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 denial, like you know, then it kind of drags on, you know, it, it, uh, that's kind of like what happened in this relationship. And look, fortunately, towards the middle, I kind of put some frameworks in place that created a clarity, so we've got a a, a methodology to unwind it and, and exit amicably and do all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I invested um, quite a bit of effort and energy and, and, and emotion into this opportunity and just in the end just didn't, just fell apart. So have you, you know, gone through that same cycle yourselves with any kind of your relationship? Hopefully not. <laughs> well, maybe. I'll let you go, Bram. I've, I, I've heard many a stories, but as a psychologist, I'd love to, love to hear your side. Oh, look, I can like I think we all have these sort of experience that straight away pop up in our minds to the extent that we allow ourselves to remember. I, I definitely have one of those that I remember. And I definitely empathize also with the, the feelings that you brought to the service there, Arthur, as in, you know, you, you got this sort of, you know, potential anger, denial. Uh, you feel frustrated at some stage. Sometimes you really get angry and agitated about it. And other times you start to have self-doubt, which is your self-esteem gets beaten down. I think I certainly remember one of those situations and it wasn't an easy one because this one was quite kind of direct in one way, but it also happened in a, in a back room with somebody else somewhere else. And it was a very hard one because as, lo as long as people are saying something direct in your face, you can deal with it. And then it's just a matter of being assertive and knowing how to deal with the direct assault, so to speak. But when it's, let's say, happening in another room and you're not there and you don't hear what's being said and you don't know the steps they're taking, it, it's, it's the, um, let's say, feeling, let's say, how it eroded me personally, on a personal level, definitely completely with you. What about you, Carly? Yeah, look, I, I've seen it so many times, you know, like a, we often hear about bullying in the schoolyard. 
but we don't often hear about in the workplace. And I was only just talking to Brahm even before we went live. I remember working with a senior leader, a female senior leader in financial services, and she was sharing with me some of the stories around her being bullied. And I was just absolutely shocked that this goes on to a senior leader not so so often we hear about it with people that are lower than that and it was so shocking to hear some of those stories from her that it actually really opened my eyes up to that kind of behavior and and you made a good point Graham you know we we often take on that emotional energy ourselves. you know when we we start to doubt ourselves, we start to have second second thoughts about it maybe it's us maybe we're the problem and we actually take on that emotional energy whereas one of the things that I've always coached leaders on is how do we remove that emotional energy because it's not about us mm -hmm. it's them it's about them so I think one of the most important points to to really try to believe in is that this is not our story this is their story it is their emotional baggage that's being brought up mm, definitely yeah. so yeah look I, I was probably talking in the context of uh you know an agency relationship and, and in the workplace there'd be so many different dynamics and and really the leader of the workplace sets the tone and and must lead by example you know and must invite you know uh 360 degree feedback because you know mm. In small business, especially, you know, there's nowhere to run if you're an employee that feeling that is feeling that way or feeling frustrated or feeling that, um, um, you know, dare say, you know, use the word bullying uh, is a very sensitive word, but you know, it could also be that the employer may not even be aware that they're actually conducting themselves that way, um, and so I think there's these um, correct steps and and uh, um, methods that any responsible employer should be exploring to ensure that that feedback loop is coming up the line and obviously in bigger businesses and you know larger businesses i'd hope obviously have you know um you know governance um supervision frameworks that feed that feedback right up to board level uh, but we're talking you know mostly the small business here and it's something that probably the business owner can miss and something that kylie you talk about and, and, and support, you know, small business with. Um, and when we say small business, I mean, small business, in, in, you know, 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million plus, you know, still, you know, that small, medium space, um, you know, having those systems in place is really important to really foster the right culture, you know, setting the tone, leading by example, being open to that feedback and having, you know, that, that, um, you know, that 360 degree review um, loop in place. Um, as a business owner, you're you know you're trying to keep your hands and eyes on all sorts of parts of the business, and sometimes you know that that information can be missing. It's very very valuable information. Mm. Yes, and in, it's interesting because I was reading some stats because you really prompted my thinking, Arthur, when when we were talking about this topic, and and you know I was reading some stats that said that um, the boss would only get rid of a toxic employee forty percent of the time. Whereas if it was up to the staff member who was dealing with it, they would get rid of them 88% of the time. So that's a really big disparity there between the person being bullied or, or being in that toxic relationship and the actual leader who should be doing something about it is actually not doing something about it. Especially yeah. if, I can, if I can just step in, especially if that is a so-called high performer. Let's just say if it's somebody that is in business development or sales and that person writes a lot of business, people are scared to let him go, even though they are corrupting everybody around them. Yeah. And that's a that problem. Yeah, Bram, from your perspective, I mean, there's where you know, there's the ego as well, right? So as the business owner, you know, you don't make mistakes, right? But yeah, hey, we all really? do. <laughs> you know, we are absolutely perfect. We don't make mistakes, but the reality is is that we absolutely make mistakes and i think in terms of that statistic kylie it's very interesting and bram you might be able to shed some light is you know maybe the disparity is coming from not wanting to be wrong yeah. and actually trying to salvage it or, or cope with it but they're not really understanding the flow and effect in your environment and the culture of your business and so sometimes i think you know and maybe rum step in anytime there might be that 
that aspect where the owner doesn't want to be seen to have made a wrong decision and, yep. and tries to kind of see if they can work their way out of it, whereas mm. the employee doesn't have that, you know, that, that level of thinking because um, they're not, I guess, the owner and then they're, they're probably a lot more decisive. Yep. Look, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Bram, you go. I'll just very quickly, I think uh, your point is a, is a very valid one. And, I, you know, being a psychologist, I think the first thing I always do is try to ascertain where people are coming from. And if you look at people's identity, you know, if you've got a leader and you question them, like, what do you reckon? What do you believe that good leadership represents? I think a lot of the time in the, as part of their self-identity, they'll describe something like, you know, I always know what to do. I, I, I lead my people through the, the hard, dif difficult uh, conversations and situations. Um, and as part of that, even though they might not say directly, they'll say there's no room for uh, vulnerability. You know, yeah. in recent times, that is actually now something that a lot of, you know, uh, great leadership books and programs are written about, which is about, yes, it is important to be vulnerable. Yes, it's okay to admit that you're a person. It's, it's okay to be emotional. But I think still a lot of people, especially probably the males or especially people that are more in the logical, rational sort of businesses, they might f find themselves very stretched by just a mere notion of, yes, you know, you should know. I should know. And if I'm not, I'm wrong. I'm letting yeah. people down. And I think that's yeah. the self-esteem thing that really a lot is connected to that self-identity. Yeah. What about I mean, you, Carl? You mentioned books, but I think there's people like Carly that can help with that kind of stuff, you know, the... You know, well, that's, yeah. Yeah, you know, there's like, you know, you know, it's a very lonely place leading a business sometimes, you know, and so who do you talk to? Who do you go to? Who do you, who do you open up and be willing to be vulnerable to say, I might need some help here. I mean, Kylie, I think you've got some great examples where you've done that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I, I think that's where I might, my opinion differs a little bit in the sense that Yes, the, the leaders might be saying, I can't get this wrong, but I think more so what I find is leaders struggle to have the conversation. If I just put it aside, hopefully it'll get better. If I don't say anything, hopefully they'll snap out of it. And if I do say something, how will it be taken? Or how do I say it right? So, so one of the things I do a lot with leaders is I provide them with models to have some of these conversations because there, there is models. There's leadership models yep. out there that help people to yep. be able to have some of these conversations. So I often find it's the leaders going, I don't know what to do or how to have this mm -hmm. conversation. I, I know I've got to do it. I know it's got to be right. I just feel uncomfortable doing it. So can you help me do it? Um, and yeah. I think that probably the first step because there is I think there's some real good tips around you know you've got to choose the battle don't you you've got to make yeah. it you've got to make it visible and on the record because Bram you were saying before it can't happen in closed doors okay mm -hmm. so yeah. you've got to make sure your record keeping is really top notch when things like that 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 yeah. happen and you've got to also be really recording some of those specific behaviors because we need to we can't be just going oh they're just saying certain things You've got to be able to go to your boss. You've got to be able to go to the HR or whoever it might be that, that you feel safe going to with really clear examples. You've got to be able to have really clear examples of around behaviours, words they've used so that they actually can be used as part of further conversations as that ev evidence, so to speak, okay? Brilliant. And I also think, um, you know, that emotional detachment, we've got to also remember that, we're at work for a long time and, and you just can't, um, you don't want to be upset in that kind of relationship. So I think jumping on it fast is also really important too. Mm. I yeah, think I one, think, uh, go, go ahead, Ron. Yeah. I was just about to say the same there, mate. They were very courteous <laughs> people. Who yeah, I was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, well, thanks for that. Well, look, um, j just I think one of the key words that, has a lot of merit to really bring back to the surface in this conversation is about trust. Uh, people trusting themselves to do the right thing, but also people trusting that they can go and see someone to talk to, whether it's the person that is actually potentially caught, uh, creating some conflict or it's somebody outside of the business or the, the group where they just want to kind of discuss the situation and not just sit with it. I think that trust thing is a very tricky one, especially in a workplace where you're like you like you, you said, Kylie. You spend so much time with these people, and if you then don't feel that you can have the conversation without, um, 
you know, reprimand or without consequences that will negatively set you back or um, where people are just willing to just listen and say, you know what, really, did I make you feel that way? I'm sorry. You know, having that, putting the ego aside, it's yeah. very tricky for a lot of people to kind of deal with it. And yes, models help, but then there's, there's still a lot more to it, right? Sometimes it, we just feel so overwhelmed that it's yeah. very hard to take the next yeah. step. Yeah. yeah, look, I mean, Kylie, you know, very, very good when there's a HR officer on site. What if the, the owner is the HR person? And, you know, it, you know, those persons really have a big responsibility to ensure that um, their, their staff um, have an open line communication and they're aware, you know, of their own, um, I guess, behaviour, conduct. Um, and, you know, sometimes these organisations, you know, the owner's scratching their head, they wonder why they can't grow because they haven't really earn the trust or the discretionary effort of their employees because um, they haven't put these, um, I guess, methodologies and, and build that culture. I mean, we, we're we a newly formed group, um, you know, in our business uh, and, and three years old but went through a significant um, acquisition recently. And, you know, we re just recently, just, you know, a couple of months ago, sat down with the leadership team after a year's worth of integration to actually set down the values of our leadership team and how we want to, be seen mm -hmm. from our clients and, and most importantly by each other and, and how we're going to hold each other to account, you know, in terms of, you know, the office communication. And so we sat down and went through an exercise of what is the values? And we don't want to come up with the usual ones, you know, excellence and not to diminish it, but we do want to come up with the usual same words. We want to create our own um, buzzwords, you know, and so, you know, ours is, you know, transparency. So, Every conversation we have with each other, we're fully transparent. Any conversation we have with any one of our clients, you know, we're fully transparent. We've got nothing to hide, and you know, we will, you know, we'll share information openly and freely uh, with with our stakeholders. You know, approachable was another one. You know, you know, when someone, you know, you know, when you, someone comes up to you and you know they're coming and they then they want something, and you know, don't be surprised about your body language how that then is interpreted by the person coming, and then they kind of like. Uh, maybe just turn the other way and go the other direction, <laughs> and that just that just holds the, the free flow of information. And uh, yeah, that's right. He sinks in the chair, and, and, and then I'll go the other way. But you know, we're all working remotely now, right? And this was important to us because how how hard is it going to be to ensure that information is flowing through an organisation? We're not going to simply walk to you and have a chat. Mm -hmm. I'm going to book you in a Zoom. And I, and I feel that if you're too busy, I've assumed that you're too busy, so I'm not moving into your space. I've got to ask for permission. So you've got to, got to flip on the other side and be very overt about it and say, you know, here's my calendar. Anytime I'm free, just book me in. Like, be really approachable. Be seen to be yeah. open door. Um, don't, don't have that um, feeling where you're, you're giving a feeling it's closed door policy. You know, it's open door policy. Be approaching, approachable. You know, learning. Hey, you know, we're a learning organization we're learning every day you know fess up if you don't know something but say make a commitment to get back to someone by a certain time so cans of attitude and understanding understanding is more around you know that empathy you know if someone's upset or frustrated about something hey there might be good reason don't put the defense mechanisms up you know there's not a blame game as soon as you get that blame in an organization you got to get rid of it straight away I mean, that's like the it's like the seed to toxicity you know, that's blame, you know, it's his fault or and so uh, or her fault. Yeah, I think, yeah, you got it now that in the head. But again, it's around clarity of role, um, you know, accountability, all these um, there's there's methodologies to ensure that everyone understands what they contribute to the organization, is clear what they're gonna deliver. And so you get, get as soon as you go into that blame game, um, you gotta jump on that. Mm. I think so, because if you don't, that's where you end up in these toxic relationships. Mm. Yeah, Kylie, uh, you look a bit frozen. There, are you still there? I'm still alive. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep streaming. We're on. We're on. We're on camera there, bro. So we'll allow the connection <laughs> to continue. Um, yeah, but that's my perspective, mate. It's um, it's really got to set the culture right and, and actually do these exercises with the team to actually mm -hmm. um, set the tone. Yep. And if people don't do it, if you don't get it right, it's so easy to have subpar performance because toxicity really affects people and as they get affected and their mind let's say gets occupied with too many 
you know, what if scenarios, am I the wrong one here? You know, who's to blame? If that's really like, you know, uh, going through people's mind, it just means that people really are, you know, not available really to do what's what's important and it consumes them completely and utterly. And so yeah. um, just in terms of problem solving, we all know that the greatest ideas come from people that just think in a great way, but guess what? If you don't feel safe because of somebody or situation, it's important that you address it because otherwise, you're just you're you'll be in your fight, fight, and survival mode in your brain, yeah. and you yeah. can't create great, great solutions there. Yeah, and sometimes it comes down to the individual. Really, you know, if if sometimes you know, I find that you're either waiting sometimes for someone to make a decision for you. It's about having the courage to actually say, you know, this isn't right for me, and um, either you know, accessing you know, resource um, that is being made available by your employer, and as they should, and if they ask for, they they, they have to. Um, but if you're the, I guess, the employee in the scenario where, you know, you're in the middle of this relationship that's not working um, and, you know, the access to the resources isn't really assisting, it's having the courage to actually talk to someone about it but also remove yourself from that, uh, that, that situation. You know, it's a hard feeling to feel trapped. Um, I have felt trapped uh, as an employee many, many, many years ago and it really was, it took me a long time to emotionally recover from... Yeah. Um, leaving that environment and it was a very what's the word uh confrontational um change environment that i probably didn't i probably had the skill set to be able to um manage myself correctly and then when i finally found the courage to to move on uh it took quite some time to recover emotionally from that so yeah it's a, it is a tough one but i think every leader has to take the responsibility to help their employees um, be able to have the courage to have that communication line with them. I and fully it's agree. In the best interest, it's in the employee's best interest and it's in the interest of the business to, to, to grow and thrive. Yep. Uh, Arthur, I'm mindful that uh, it's 22 minutes now into our live stream. I think we probably uh, should, should do a bit of a wrap up, but hey, we are very curious to hear, you know, from people, you know, what your thoughts are on the topic, you know, what your experience might have been. And, uh, yeah, of course, we're always here to uh, to have a chat for people that would want that as well. Right, Arthur? Yeah, yeah no worries at all. You can PM us at any time. Uh, LinkedIn profile should be made available. Uh, work out what happened to Kylie. But we will be doing this regularly. So uh, this is the uh, the, the, the team, um, Ram, Kylie, and I, and looking forward to uh, streaming live with you next time on another great topic. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye. Cheers. See you.